my pleasure to introduce uh, our panel of uh, Uber investors, um, starting in alphabetical order in the middle, Tom Dan. Tom is Managing Director of Equity Funds at the Maryland Venture Fund. He's an experienced venture investor. He was the founder and managing director of Castle, Castle Haven Advisors, and he oversees the 17-year-old state venture fund. Uh, you've been in the position for how long, Tom? A couple of months now? or Since July. Since July. So um, the fund, I think Tom will talk about the fund that just received some nice capital, and uh, Tom's looking for great deals. Tom uh, is, has an experience in private equity, venture capital, public and private initiatives, he was also the founder of eCentury Capital in 1999, served as managing director and general counsel until 2011. Tom is a, has a Bachelor of Arts from Stanford and a JD from American U, and he's a member of several bars. And uh, do you regret leaving the legal profession at all? Or? Uh, let me think about that for a second, no. <laughs> okay. Um, next is Paul Singh. Paul just got off a plane from India. So, uh, Paul, are you awake? Sort of. You do? Okay, good. Welcome. Paul is partner and master of the hustle of 500 startups. I I'm dying to ask Paul how the entrepreneur feels when he hands him a card that says master of the hustle. Um, but uh, I want to hear all about you guys. You're a super angel fund headquartered in California, founded in July of 2010, and you've already funded 400 companies in 20 countries. Is that correct? Yeah, we do one new deal on average every 48 to 72 hours somewhere on the planet. I want to talk about your due diligence process for that. But, uh, <laughs> I'll blow your mind. Um, so Paul's also an EIR with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and uh, DHS USCIS. And prior to 500 startups, Paul was a founder of a few of his own startups, two successful exits, and a number of failures in between. And uh, he spent some time at PV Works, AOL, and Symantec. Paul's also a blogger on realresultsjunkies.com, and he can be found on at Paul Singh on Twitter. Uh, to my immediate left, Tom Weithman, Managing Director of the CIT Gap Funds. So since 2004, Tom has established and led the Gap Funds. It's a family of seed stage uh, venture funds focused on making equity investments in state of Virginia-based companies. I know when I joined your board, Tom, you were doing IT and bio, and we are just growing like crazy, right? We absolutely are. So, terrific. Um, Tom can talk a little bit about the companies that he's invested in. I'm sure he'd love to talk about the number one ranked Notre Dame Golden Dome, which he's a graduate of. Um, but uh, without further ado, because we're running a little bit late on time, I'd like to, um, why don't we start with Tom, maybe talk a little bit about your fund, your source of funds, the kinds of deals you're trying to do, and your investment philosophy. Why don't we start with Tom, uh, Tom Weissman, yeah. and then go right down the line. Okay. I don't think my microphone is on. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, so we've been at this since, I guess, December 2004, we launched our first fund. And the Commonwealth of Virginia is, uh, provides most of the funding. We get an annual reload through the appropriations process. That said, we also have funding, funds under management from the federal government, from some Recovery Act funding, through which we've done some clean tech investment, and a grant from Johnson & Johnson, through which uh, we do life science investment through a dedicated fund. So we have grown by leaps and bounds over the last couple of years. And the, the, uh, the Virginia appropriation process has been kind to us in the last couple of years. If you turn back the hands of time, uh, just three fiscal years, we had a half million dollars to deal with, which is a pretty thin gruel for seed stage investing. Over the last couple of years under the McDonald administration, economic development and new job creation through startup company formation, we've been the recipient of, uh, of significantly greater funds that's enabled uh, investment at uh, a greatly enhanced pace. Uh, last year, we did 28 first-time investments and a significant number of transactions uh, for uh, other companies in the portfolio. Um, in terms of investment philosophy, we try to be uh, the first money in or, or among the first money in, certainly within the first uh, half million or so in, in a company. Uh, we like to be uh, involved in the earliest stages of formation and flatter ourselves with taking a fairly active investment uh, 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 or an active role in the investment process and company building process. Uh, as the bandwidth of our team and our expanding portfolio permits. Terrific. Thank you, Tom. 
Tom, Dan, can you talk a little bit about the Maryland Venture Fund and what you sure. all are doing? I know sure, there's thanks, a, lot of, a lot of new news here, so. Yeah, there's been a lot of news in Maryland over the last year. The, the, the Venture Fund, as many of you know, has been operating since 1995, I think. We've invested in about 115 uh, companies uh, historically. And uh, <clears throat> during the last few years, uh, it hadn't really been funded by the legislature, and so the activity of the venture fund had really been limited to just recycling uh, what we were generating out of our investments. Uh, over this last year, there's been a real sea change in Maryland. Uh, the governor uh, and legislature pushed through uh, this Invest Maryland program, which uh, they took $100 million in tax credits, insurance sales tax uh, that has to get paid on every insurance company or excuse me, every insurance policy. And so they sold these credits to insurance companies at a slight discount and raised eight, <coughs> $84 million in cash. And that money is all being focused on investing in venture in the state of Maryland. Uh, we also have about another uh, $20 million uh, that came in through some federal stimulus money that we're focusing on early stage investing. So right now we have roughly $100 million to invest in venture in Maryland. Half of that money we're actually investing in venture funds with a view to trying to bring more active and engaged venture funds you know, into the state's ecosystem and ho hopefully there'll be a multiplier impact on that as those venture funds then bring in their syndicate partners and we just help facilitate a more vibrant uh, venture economy in the state. The other half of the money, which is about $45 million, we're direct investing uh, in, uh, in Maryland companies. And we're really looking at having kind of a bifurcated sort of barbell type investment strategy where we're investing on one end of the spectrum small amounts in the $100,000, $200,000 range in earlier stage companies. And here we see a lot of overlap with, with angels. So a lot of the companies that come in and talk to us, we ask who else are you talking to and it's frequently uh, it's, it's just other angel groups. Uh, and so that's sort of one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum, we're really looking at doing kind of more classic uh, venture deals and Series A, Series B kind of deals. So, go ahead. Terrific. Thanks, Tom. How about you, Paul? Yeah, so by the way, real quick, these chairs remind me of airplanes taking off or landing. I've just been, I, I, he, he was actually right. I, I just got off a plane from uh, Delhi about an hour ago. I, I do not smell, I took a shower, I'm good, but um, this year I've probably done about 15,000 miles on average per month. In uh, any case, so I, I run a venture fund called 500 Startups. Um, before I tell you who, what we do, I'll tell you um, what most people don't realize is we pretty much started here. Um, my partner Dave and I, actually from here, I grew up in, uh, in Ashburn, he grew up in, uh, in the Baltimore area, and we actually met in a bar on K Street uh, like five years ago. Um, in any case, so we started the fund about two years ago. Um, we are on our second global fund now. Our first fund was 30 million. Our second fund is 50. Um, when I describe us to investors, I describe us as the card counters at the blackjack table. And when I describe us to founders, I say that we're an API to venture capital and functional expertise. Um, so what that really means, um, in the last two years, we've, done, uh, we've now invested in just over 425 companies in 20 countries now. Um, believe it or not, most of our activity is outside of Silicon Valley. And one of the observations I'll just give you real quick as an aside is the challenges that a founder faces in D.C. versus a founder in Nebraska versus a founder in Delhi is actually all the same. Uh, there's a lack of um, access to early stage venture capital. There's an access, a lack of early stage uh, functional expertise. Um, but in any case, we do do, on average, one new deal somewhere on the planet uh, every uh, 48 to 72 hours. Our thesis is that um, we bake in the ideas of risk and uncertainty into our models. And so for any of the poker players out there or, or um, quants, you'll recognize that risk and uncertainty are two very different things. We actually account for that in our models and the way that we, uh, the way that that kind of shows through in terms of like our due diligence. And I'll talk more about the tech that I built for that. But um, the point is though, is that um, we just index the market with a bunch of early stage checks. Our median check size is about $50,000. We typically don't buy more than 5% of the company. We typically are not more than 30% of the round. Um, but when we see something that works, we double down heavy, right? So going back to the analogy of the card counter, I sit down at the table, 
I'm playing, I'm playing the minimum hand while I count the cards. And as soon as I see the pattern, you see me go in heavy, real heavy. So we use about 30% of our money to index the market. Um, each of our global funds is designed for about 250 initial bets, and then 70% is for follow-on. Uh, that model's worked really well for us. We've had 17 exits so far. Uh, the largest was actually our most recent, about three months ago, was um, uh, a company that sold for about a half a billion dollars to Google. Uh, so if you do the math on that, the IRR was real good, and that's only one of 17. So uh, we're a little bit new, we're a little bit innovative, but uh, it seems to be working. Right. Well, Paul, can you talk about how you guys um, analyze your deals? I'm familiar with a little bit with what uh, Tom and his team do over at CIT. I would say it's a pretty rigorous, to say the least, process. Um, how about you guys? I mean, to put out that kind of money to 400 companies in a year and a half, I mean, what are you, you're just saying you're making bets, you're placing bets, you're indexing the market. Well, what kind of, give us a little insight into your, you know, thinking. Yeah, so I think, um, let me just first start off by saying that I'm not suggesting that our art model is right by any means. I'm just suggesting that we've chosen a thesis that we're playing against, just like every other investor chooses a thesis when they go raise money from their LPs. Um, and everybody's got their own thesis. And I think as long as you stick with your thesis, then you're good. It's when you start deviating that, that uh, things go south. Um, so a couple things. Uh, well, the next thing I would just say is like, you know, what's interesting to me is I, I approach venture capital as a startup as well. Um, and um, what I always found interesting about venture capital is that we expect the founders we fund to innovate, yet we don't. Does that make sense, everybody? So we, we invest in people as an industry. And when I say we, I'm saying as an industry, we give you money and then we say, all right, go innovate while I go play some golf or something. Um, I suck, by the way. But, um, so, but we as an industry, we generally speaking, we choose to behave like the VCs that came before us. And the fact is that like, those days are over now. Startups are changing. Um, and venture capital used to be about capital, deal flow, and judgment. And today, it's about access. If the founder thinks you're an asshole, you're not, gonna get a, you're not even get to, gonna get to play to put money into that table or into that. Uh. So for us, the way that we actually filter the deals is the first filter is um, referral only. So what we do is we actually um, we, uh, we look for founders or mentors. So we have about 1,000 founders now around the world. We have about 192, I think, active mentors with us. Uh, we're looking for two to three of them with significant subject matter expertise in your area of startup uh, to refer you. Um, and then, we, uh, then that passes you to the next stage, which is probably a phone call and then some data analysis through our platform. One thing I should just say is that we track very, very carefully who's referring what. So you send me three bad deals and I excommunicate you from the community. And that's like we're very, very, very rigorous about it. Every quarter there's a bloodbath. Um, a quiet one, but there is a bloodbath. Uh, so once you pass that, then we actually have our data models that we go back and look at. Um, not only have we invested in 400 companies, but we've looked at thousands of them. We're also, through the platforms that I built, we're tracking um, about 40,000 entities on any given day, looking at public market data. Uh, for those of you in the public markets, think of me as an algorithmic trader or a high frequency trader. So we're pulling in data from about 80, 85 different data sources and then predicting the markets that way. And then the third step, uh, if you check out, is that there's a quick checklist that I go through with the founder real quick. And it's basically designed to make sure that you're not some crazy Yahoo. If you're, if you're not gonna fit into the culture, we just won't give you the check. Um, but we look for basic things like, is the hacker hustler designer core team there? We don't want any outsourcing. Is the revenue model clean? Even if it's not there, I'd, I, I'm okay with investing before the revenue model, but um, we want to kind of understand what your thought process is. Um, we, we look for uh, um, a focus on data design and distribution. All these things are online, by the way. I'm a little, little jet lagged. But it's a checklist of like eight things. If any one of those boxes isn't checked after that 20 minute call, we just walk away. But if all that passes, you get a median check of about $50,000, and then we just wait and see what happens. Um, so arguably, it's kind of hard to get that first 50 check, 50K check, although if you really think about it, most of those decisions are made in a total of less than 20 minutes. It might, it might take a week <laughs> just to kind of get through the different stages because of the pipeline or the backlog, but on average, it's like, anecdotally, it's, it's like seven to 20 minutes for that first check. Just wait and see. And, the second check will get a little bit trickier. But anyway, that's, so we mitigate it through, we mitigate that risk through um, just a new process that we've built for it. 
Terrific. I have a question for the two Toms, and I guess we can start with Tom Dan. How do you source your deals? Um, and can you walk us through a little bit your, your diligence process? Is it a 20 minute process or is it longer than that? Okay, thanks. You're, you're uh, just trying to pick well, fights now. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we deal with a, a, a different set of, uh, of limitations in terms of our basic approach to how we source deals to begin with. I mean, you know, you, you have, uh, Paul, uh, an investment thesis that, you know, has a global application and you pull from everywhere that you can for that. You know, we are necessarily limited to investing in, and like Tom is, to investing uh, in within our state, which makes it a little more difficult to develop a an investment thesis that has, you know, like let's go out and find the best company in this particular application or sector. You know, we really are forced into a little bit more reactive mode of seeing, you know, what actually bubbles up out of the state's economy. Uh, and uh, so, you know, w within that, we also are challenged by the fact that we, it's difficult for us, particularly because we're a state, you know, entity, to focus on any one sector of the economy. So our sector focuses as broad as, as really the state's economy. We're dealing with you know, life sciences, cybersecurity, clean tech, everything all the way across the board. And that's a real challenge to us in terms of how do you get smart uh, in any one of those areas to invest. And there's two ways that you deal with it. One is, you know, we are hiring people who can get smart really fast in particular sectors that we're deciding to take a close look at our companies. But also we're, we're integrating sort of down into the, um, the food chain into groups that are already working with companies and doing a lot of the due diligence and bubbling these companies up uh, so that they get to the point where they're ready for us to make an investment. And these would include players like, uh, you know, incubators in the state or, uh, you know, Tedco, groups like that that are already working with companies that are pre-revenue companies, even pre-investment or just getting grants so that when, when we're making these little investments that I talked about in that 1000 or excuse me, $100,000 range where we don't really have the resources to go deep on, as, as deep on due diligence, we, we rely on those partners to in fact kind of, in effect kind of package those deals for us. Um, and so that uh, we are feeling as though, when this gets back to you, the quality referral issue that you're talking about, when, when, when a deal gets sent to us by them that we feel as though this is one of the best ones that has percolated up through their system. You know, the other thing that we do, and, and, and this is trying to be proactive, uh, is really searching out the entrepreneurs in uh, the state who, you know, they're maybe moving on to their next company, about to move on to their next opportunity, and really focusing on them and going earlier with them in terms of, of making an earlier bet on them than we normally would. I mean, typically we'd be looking at a company that, let's say, uh, already is early revenues and they've got some referenceable customers and we would put a bet in on them. But if it's a company where we see a, an entrepreneur who we know and we've dealt with before, we would definitely go much, much earlier in backing that entrepreneur. Um, so otherwise, uh, I mean, we're, we're doing a number of different structural things to try to increase the amount of deal flow that comes into us from uh, companies in Maryland. We have a program that we've initiated called the Invest Maryland Challenge, uh, which is, uh, it's actually, they're taking applications for this right now, but we're giving away three $100,000 grants to early stage companies that, that win in each of three different categories, one being life sciences, one IT, and then one is kind of a, an other category, which includes, by the way, uh, companies from outside of maybe companies in Virginia that maybe want to come and move over across the state. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll consider them for that as well. But uh, there are also a number of other kinds of uh, incentives and prizes in this whole process that are being put up by different sponsors for, for instance, the University of Maryland has a prize for the best uh, company uh, founded by a Maryland, University of Maryland grad. And so there's there are a number of different you know, positive uh, incentives for companies to, to participate. But what we get out of this is you know, every company that's in this sort of band of under 25 employees, under a million in revenues that applies for this, we're getting a really good look at them 
but also because, and there may be some of you that are participating in this as judges, those companies also get a very good look from a lot of people because they go through several different iterations of review by the judging process, and these are from you know, angels and, and other, other VCs uh, and, and other players in the venture community, so they get a lot of exposure from that. And, uh, and we're doing things like that to enhance our deal flow. Terrific, and I, I think also be, being that you just got a big slug, you got to go out and start marketing where, say, Tom Weithman has sort of been in, in it for a while uh, from a state funding standpoint and is now growing. But, Tom, can you talk a little bit about uh, how you're sourcing deals and what you're looking for and the sure, process? We've been at it for a while, but, but we're still hungry and we're still out there prospecting. Um, so we have uh, our, the limitations that we have are, are, are largely the same as Tom's and that we are, are focused on a particular geographic footprint. Uh, some of the restrictions might be subtly different in that we are a private nonprofit. We're not a part of the government apparatus in the Commonwealth. <laughs> it just is not meant to be. I, I hope this is a little bit better. So uh, if we look at our portfolio, and we've done 80-some deals now, about two-thirds of those have come through some trusted source, uh, either someone in the service provider community that we know, uh, perhaps an entrepreneur that we've had the, the luxury of observing through a long period of time uh, through uh, interaction with one of CIT's other program offerings, like the SBIR assistance program that Robert Brook runs, like the CRCF uh, 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 grant program run by Nancy Verona, where R&D funds are made available to companies at a very early stage. Those serve as, as good feeders to us. We also do a fair amount of prospecting out in the community and try to remain active in all areas of the state uh, from which technology uh, deal, based deal flow is, is likely to arise. We see a lot of life sciences uh, around, around central Virginia with VCU and, and UVA, the great technology down at Virginia Tech here in northern Virginia and in Hampton Roads. So we, we try to maintain a close association with those communities through a variety of mechanisms, not the least of which is, is regular outreach uh, tours and office hours that we maintain. Uh, as the portfolio gets bigger, we have the luxury of generating deal flow from within the portfolio as well, and nothing speaks better to the caliber company than an endorsement from a portfolio CEO. One of the other things that we're doing this year that's kind of innovative to, uh, to stimulate deal flow in our connection with the entrepreneurial community in Virginia, uh, in this 2013, the year of the entrepreneur as designated by government, Governor McDonald, is the GAP50 Awards Program. And this is, uh, we're having a luncheon uh, here in Northern Virginia on Thursday uh, where we will be celebrating the top 50 entrepreneurs designated by the entrepreneurial community in Virginia. So over the last year, we have made a lot of acquaintances, a lot of new friends around the Commonwealth and, and surfaced a large pool of would-be entrepreneurs and have asked that pool of entrepreneurs to designate who they think are the top 50 in the state that are most likely to generate high growth companies over the next five to seven years. So it's been a great exercise and a great way to connect um, with, uh, with the community. So deal flow comes to us a, a variety of ways. Our diligence process is uh, um, you know, fairly rigorous, a little bit different than, than Paul's. Not that yours isn't rigorous, but we don't have the luxury of playing in a global uh, deal flow pool. I have a question for the panel, which is um, there's some people in the room that are looking to raise money, anywhere from 250 say, to a couple of million. What, uh, what advice do you have for uh, increasing their chances? And I know that um, you guys are obviously investing. People are taking your money because they want the brand recognition, right? Being affiliated with 500 startups or CIT is a great thing. Um, the network that you can bring. But, you know, how do they increase their chances of, of getting capital from your organizations? What two or three things would you suggest? And I'll throw that out for all of you guys. Well, well, I think, um, I think, is is the question? Uh, do they for those people? Do they want to raise that amount for their first check? Yes. So the advice I would give, um, well, the advice I give my own portfolio is that you probably don't want to. If you can avoid it, don't go out to the market and say I want to raise half a million bucks or I want to raise a million bucks or whatever. And by the way, as an aside, whoever I, I saw a few of the pitches here today, um, don't ever give a range of how much you want to raise, right? Because, like, of course I'm going to go for the low end of that range, and of course you're going to go for the high end of the range. So let's just stop messing around and just pick the number. But the point is, is, like, if let's say you need a million bucks. I think, just imagine here for a minute, there's a difference between how the market perceives you the minute you walk out and you say, I'm going to raise a million bucks versus I'm going to raise 300K. The latter, or the, sorry, the former will have, it'll require a lot of inertia to kind of get off the ground. Uh, you're probably going to need a few people to help lead it. And it's just, it's harder 
one thing you should think about is, is how do you break the round up into like one third, two third? How do you start out with 300K, get people on? Because what you're really trying to do is get to this magical word called oversubscribed. And a lot of magical things happen once you get oversubscribed. You can either extend the note, you can bump to another, another valuation, you can do all sorts of stuff. But um, um, think about an innovative way to, to kind of approach fundraising rather than sort of the bland, like I'm going to raise a million bucks and hope that somebody here writes you half a million dollars. My, my data suggests it's not happening. We're seeing million dollar rounds that are all co-investors, typically in the fifty to $70,000 range. So just think about that, actually. That's probably really important to understand is that you must think of your round as like being... Uh, the, the, the all the literature you read online will talk about how you need to find a lead and all this stuff, but in practice, if you look at the data, that's just not true for rounds that are under 1.5 million. It's just going to be co-invested anyway. So, but so Paul, on a million dollar raise, when you have 15 to 20 investors putting in between 50 and 80,000, who goes first? I mean, do you guys come in first or do you guys come in with? I mean, how would an entrepreneur sort of herd all those cats together? Yeah, so I think um, the, every, those are all being done on convertible notes. So, I mean, look, I, for, for most of the investors in here, I'm just, just like you. I'd prefer a, a, uh, an equity round and, you know, just do that. But the fact is, for the first round, for many entrepreneurs, for the first round, it's actually better to do convertible notes. Uh, if you're not familiar with those founders, you should probably just go to venturehacks.com slash archives and read everything on there. Um, but with convertible notes, you can do uh, high resolution fundraising. So it doesn't matter whether I'm first, last, or in the middle. If I say yes, I can wire you the money the same day and just sign this little document. It's like two pages. Uh, and you just start running. Um, that's the problem with equity rounds, for example, is you got to get everybody on board and everybody's looking at everybody else. And yeah. um, we, as much as we hate to admit it, we are herd animals, um, right? Investors know what I'm talking about too, right? Because if you ask an investor, you're like, are you, are you a herd animal? They're like, no, 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 I, I just, I, I really believe in the founder. And you're like, fuck that, you don't do that. <laughs> you're waiting to see who else is in the deal. And like, that's the first question founders get asked. It's like, who else, who else put money in? Um, anyway, convertible notes. Convertible notes is the best way to, uh, to, herd, uh, to herd the cats. I think I just made some people uncomfortable. Half of you were, I think I just figured out who the founders are and who the investors are, actually. <laughs> F you too, man. <laughs> That's coming from a lawyer. So, uh, uh, Tom and Tom, you want to weigh in a little? Yeah, I mean, just a, a comment on what Paul was just saying. I, you know, I think at the, in the early rounds where you can really get wrapped around the valuation question, uh, given where a company is, it's uh, convertible notes shorten that conversation a lot. And, uh, you know, I mean, if you were going to have a, a formula in an equity round for how it would close, it would be, you know, dollars, you know, times valuation equals time that it takes to raise the, uh, the round. And, and it gets to be a lot faster. The one thing that I, I see on the, uh, on the, uh, the, the, the early uh, convertible note rounds, is, is, which is what really turns the dial and it's kind of like the proxy for valuation is what the discount is to the next round and, uh, and how that gets discounted uh, depends a lot on what you think you're going to accomplish with the money you're raising now and where the company will be by the time you actually get exposed to the equity market and get your company priced. And if there's an expectation that this early high risk money that you're raising enough and it's going to push you to the point where you have a much higher valuation, then you're probably, if you're an entrepreneur, you're going to be getting some pressure to increase the discount rate because of this early risk that's being taken that's not going to be rewarded with a high valuation at the back end. Uh, so that's, that's the where you would tend to get wrapped around, around the axle on negotiation there. Uh, but what was your question again? Uh, what two or three pieces of advice would you give a, an entrepreneur looking to, to raise yeah, money? Yeah, uh, I guess the other, the other piece is really matching um, the uh, amount that you're raising to the investor pool that you're going after. Uh, because one of the things that we find is, you know, companies that are say, well, we want to raise a million or two million, and we're going to go out and talk to all these VCs, when VCs are looking to do, you know, a, a $3 million round, it ends up being kind of a short conversation or a lot of conversations that end up with a lot of maybes uh, and nothing definitive. So um, 
the uh, it's it's you know you, you get to this million dollar round you're really talking about angels with, with us you know, as I said before when we're talking to companies and looking to put in these relatively small earlier amounts we do see that it's really the uh, the co-investors there we're, we're looking at are, are other angels so uh, uh, but I like to con the for early on I like the convertible note. Mm -hmm. Tian, can I just yes. kind of sidestep the question and answer the one that I wish had been asked? I just want to know who's going to win the game. It is Washington. <laughs> but yes, who's going to win the game? We can be well, political. <laughs> we won't even talk about the Heisman Award. But uh, uh, okay. In any event, uh, you know, we try to uh, to size the dollars out and the instrument that we use to the circumstances of the raise. So we're comfortable doing equity. We're comfortable doing a convertible note. Uh, we try to tune everything that we do around, um, around a, a reasonable proof point, either technology uh, development oriented or business development oriented, and we'll deploy a, an amount of money that enables the, the company to get to that proof point. Maybe it's raising, maybe it's sufficiently catalytic to get to an A round, maybe it's simply advancing the technology to a certain, to a certain break point that, that will give us confidence to deploy more money or give others confidence to deploy more money. So if we come in alone or come in early, we will more than likely do a convertible debenture, and that's what most of our investments have been, done, have, uh, been historically. Over the last couple of years, however, as we also syndicate uh, largely with high net worth individuals, with angels, uh, we find ourselves moved toward uh, in the direction of equity instruments. That's what others in the marketplace, likely co-investors, want to do. So we've experimented with Series Seed and, and other things like that and have found those to be adequate, and, and we'll continue to do that and advance those with companies as long as... Uh, as long as, as the valuation and the, and the, uh, uh, the arguments around the finer points don't, you know, don't, don't cause the, the, the uh, deal to buckle under its own weight. So convertible debt is, is generally easy to swallow, but it depends on what the investor syndicate wants to do. Uh, and for us, if an investor syndicate is re required, then we have to consider those needs. And it all comes down to diligence and, and what we think that raise needs to be to move the company around. Tom, are you saying that there's a trend now toward away from notes and towards equity? Or? I would say the last couple of years we have seen in the angel community greater interest in doing equity financing, so at least the people that we work with in this area, in this region. Right. Paul? Uh, I, what, one of the things that, relating to these kinds of early equity uh, financing rounds, that uh, one of the things where, where, uh, where we run into problems with some of these deals is where you have an early company that's getting a, a doing an equity round and the valuation they bring a bunch of angels into the valuation is higher than how we would value the company based on the kind of due diligence and metrics and return metrics that we have uh, and so you know then to me it's a question of uh if if and i'm looking at this really from our perspective is if we feel as though the company is raising money at a valuation that doesn't re that maybe perhaps represents more where they will be rather than where they are today is they really need to be raising enough money so that they will be able to grow into that valuation before they have to raise money again because it's uh, it, it's it's painful if you get out to that later point you have to raise more money you haven't achieved the kinds of uh, advances in the company that can justify the higher valuation and suddenly you're having a conversation with all your investors about doing a, a down round you know you really want to be able to finance the company out to where at a minimum they're going to be able to do a flat round in that next round of, uh, of financing if it's an equity round Paul did you have something well, um, well I, I was just going to add that um, uh, so I think I, we've seen sort of the opposite trend as, as Tom, which is we're seeing more and more people move to the, the, the idea of convertible notes. Um, the thing I would just add here, though, and this is sort of maybe more part of my thesis, and I'll try not to like uh, ramble for too long, but I just want to point out that, believe it or not, the private markets behave very, very, very similar to the public markets in the sense that they're highly vulnerable to fear and greed, right? So, so what happens is if fear goes up in the community, then we would say the markets... Uh, uh, in a panic or in the private markets, we wouldn't invest in new companies, right? D due diligence goes up and check sizes or check numbers go down. If greed goes up, then diligence goes down and yada, yada, yada. Now, the thing is, though, is that the, the assertion I'll make is that we know, I think we all know that venture capital is a hits-driven business. And we also know that roughly speaking, historically, there's only ever been 10 to 15 deals every year that actually move the needle for the fund. So the paradox of investing today is, unfortunately, is um, that while we all want to invest in the best founders, the best founders, by definition, are able to, uh, to create a market for their shares. Then by definition, they don't actually need us, right? And so the, 
the thing that's really important to recognize, we don't necessarily have to agree on it, but what we have to recognize is that I think the, the entrepreneurs are in power today. The entrepreneurs are in power today. It doesn't matter whether we're angels or VCs or whatever. If uh, It goes back to what I was saying earlier, is that like, it used to be about capital, deal flow, and judgment. So because we have the money, it used to be that we would just put up our flag, you guys would come running, we get, that's our deal flow, and then we get to judge you. But unfortunately, because there's crowdfunding and all these other things now, like access to early stage money is a commodity now. Let's make no mistake about it, it's a commodity now. For, you, for founders, for example, if you don't realize it, if you raise money and go to Singapore, I'm kind of generalizing, read the rules on this, but if you raise money and you go to Singapore, they'll 5X your money, right? So the point is, though, is that um, uh, <coughs> angels have to do, uh, investors have to do whatever's best for the founders, and I think the best way founders can actually, um, and this is how I'll tie it back to the original question, is the best way founders um, can raise that money, certainly there's all the tactics that we just talked about and the trends we just talked about, but you know, everybody tells you focus on traction, traction, traction. I think, I see lots of people that focus on traction. Where people fail is they suck at communication. They suck at storytelling. And I think if founders would just spend a little bit of time learning to communicate and inspire, you'd go a long way towards raising money a little bit easier because as VCs, regard, you know, we all have our limitations in terms of Maryland and, and Virginia and I've got limitations too, but if you can just communicate to us cleanly and maybe even inspire us, we actually have to invest. We don't get to just sit on this money and, uh, I mean, I think you guys would agree, right? Like our LPs will all probably look at us funny if we're not, if we're not actually writing checks uh, to some extent. Nobody wants to answer that, I guess. But anyway, I, I know my LPs really do expect us to invest. But learn to communicate. That's the key. What about West Coast versus East Coast and all this talk that we hear from time to time about uh, Silicon Valley versus D.C.? Tom, I know you've spent some time. Tom, Dan, California. Uh, Paul, you're really bi-coastal. You're probably spending more time in California than... Uh, no? You're spending more, most of your time here? Uh, or, the, I'm, or, I'm at home in the air, actually. <laughs> On an airplane. But what, what kinds of things can we be doing here in D.C. to sort of continue the, the great momentum we're on and to, uh, to take it to another level? I know Kendrick and, and Carl would be very interested in doing that because they're supporting what's going on at D.C. Tech. Um, but what, what kinds of things are you, would you suggest that we sort of um, work on to improve the ecosystem? You know, well, I, I think what we're looking at in Maryland is, you know, what are the, uh, the strengths that we have in Maryland that are competitive with places like Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, I mean, that clearly Silicon Valley has such a, a more vibrant ecosystem there that it's very easy for, and the pricing on, on deals out there is more attractive to entrepreneurs. Uh, it's easy for, for uh, companies to get pulled out there, but you know, where we see our strengths is being in, you know, areas like uh, life sciences, where we've got, you know, University of Maryland, NIH, you know, a lot of, resources here in the state that are spinning out a lot of technology and there's a, sort of an increasing engine of uh, tech transfer that's, that's, that's pushing that out into the commercial world. Uh, another area because of all the black agencies and the presence of the federal government is obviously cybersecurity and there are a lot of companies that are getting started here. There are, uh, we're starting to see West Coast VCs showing up here because they see this as being a more target rich uh, environment for them uh, in that sector. So, you know, concentrating some of our resources in areas where we feel as though the state has a natural advantage and then trying to kind of build a, a, an ecosystem around that is really our goal. I, I don't think it should be seen as like a us versus them thing at all, actually. I mean, I think if, if, you, if we were to look at the last 10 years of venture capital, or maybe, maybe the last three years of venture capital, the one, if, and, and let's say you asked me what's the one thing that's changed in venture capital over the last three years, I would say it's just transparency. It's a fact that as the web gets bigger, the world gets smaller, and so like, I, I agree with Tom that like, each region has its, has its um, you know, strengths and stuff like that. Uh, totally agree with that, but like, the fact is that I don't think we should be looking at it uh, in terms of, um, uh, us versus them. I think what we should be looking at it at from, the angle we should look at it from is, is how do we help founders build uh, better companies? That's, that's, the, that's the sole way that ecosystems get better, is that the founders actually have to build strong businesses. It's not, it's not going to be the investors that are pumping. We pump money in because the founders are there. It's not the other way around. Right. So, but definitely should not be us versus them.
Anything, Tom? You know, I don't know that I do have much to add, but I'm, re I'm reminded of, of, uh, of a, a long-dead economist, uh, uh, David Ricardo, who, who wrote about the theory of comparative advantage and that uh, a region or a, a country uh, should emphasize what it does relatively well compared to other areas, not compete directly against. And I think that's where, where, where Tom is going with, with cyber, with, with life sciences, and that there are some natural strengths here, uh, some, some things that can't be duplicated elsewhere. There are things in Silicon Valley, there are things in Austin and New York and Boston that can't be duplicated. And we shouldn't seek to duplicate them. We should seek to exploit our natural strengths. The one thing I think this area could do better, however, is, is to celebrate entrepreneurship. Uh, to, uh, to grow patient and acceptance of failure and, and um, uh, you know, comfortable with, with giving folks a second try and a third try and a fourth try. That's yeah. how to build an entrepreneurial ecosystem, I believe. Great. Yeah, I wanted to open, open up the floor to questions in, in a little while. I have one final question, and then we can turn it over, and Lori will have a microphone. But for the three of you, what are you guys seeing for the coming year um, in terms of trends, whether it's industry or deal, deal terms or macro trends? Um, you know, what do you guys put on your uh, thinking or whatever, peer into your crystal ball, and uh, just give us a couple of... Uh, thoughts that you might have for what we can expect to see in the next year? I feel like I'm always going first. I, you know, the funny thing about this job is that, like, as a, once you become a VC, you're allowed to say all these big isms and wave your hands around, and if you're right 1% of the time, people think you're a genius, which is kind of cool, actually. Um, so in one line, I would say that this decade is going to be recognized as the rise of the entrepreneur and the rise of the angels. And I do this, I just did this talk uh, in, in Bangalore and Mumbai last week, but I'll, I'll elaborate later. But that's the point, is that this decade will be the rise of the angels and the rise of the entrepreneurs. So can, can angel investors actually make money? I know John Backus, his business school uh, classmate, wrote a nice piece on angel investing. I mean, is it, can angels make money? I think, uh, I think the short answer is yes, but you have to think about it from the perspective of it's not about capital or your judgment or your deal flow. It's about access. It's about access. If, if you don't get into that deal, that, that deal with that one founder, you might as well not have invested in those 10 other deals anyway. Got it. Yeah, I, uh, I think that uh, one of the trends that is, is, uh, is, is really beneficial, particularly if you're an angel investor, uh, and it's been happening really over the last 10 years and will continue to happen, is that uh, it's gotten to be a lot less expensive to get a technology company up and going. Just the virtualization of everything has cut the cost so much that what you'd have to spend $10 million on in 1999 is now, you know, a couple hundred grand. And, and that's just a huge trend favoring, uh, you know, risk takers. If, if, if you can go out there and raise a little bit of money and get your company much further advanced and be able to know whether it's going to be successful or not, that's, that's probably the biggest trend I see that's a real positive. Uh, from the standpoint of can angel investors succeed, I, I think a lot of it is maybe focusing on, um, you know, what kinds of business models are you investing in? And this ties to the first comment is, you know, if you're investing in really capital efficient business models where you're going to be able to continue to play in that investment and protect your investment and it's not going to be so capital intensive that you'll be crushed by the later money that comes in. Uh, and this, you know, this is where you're not necessarily looking at always investing in companies that are going to be big venture backed companies. There are a lot of really good investments where, you know, they just need to raise $500,000 and then they end up getting bought for 10 by somebody and you make a really nice return on your investment. So there are different kinds of business models and different kinds of exit expectations that can, as an angel, actually get you a nice return without necessarily exposing you to uh, the funding risk that's out there. Thanks, Tom. Tom Weifman? I guess I see, as, as has been already pointed out, democratization, uh, both in the technology side and, and the, the, the capital side of the equation. It's, it's easier, it's cheaper, it's more capital efficient to build certain types of companies. It's easier to access capital given the proliferation of angel groups. Um, crowdsourcing to me is an open question. Maybe that's something that, that, we'll, we'll, that we'll deal with downstream here, but an interesting thing to look at in terms of the democratization of capital. We'll see how, uh, how fungible capital truly is, how, um, how widely spread it can be. Um, I think there's a period, though, of uncertainty that remains in terms of 
the innovation associated with more capital intensive enterprises that don't lend themselves necessarily or not obviously to the lean startup methodology toward uh, capital efficient low dollar financings uh, or toward crowdsourcing things like life science uh, other uh, capital intensive uh, intensive endeavors in, uh, in in advanced manufacturing and materials and things like that uh, I'm not sure where that innovation comes from in, in this country and it'll be interesting to uh, uh, to observe and to try to participate in that process in the in the months and years ahead. Great. How, one final, and then we'll go to go to the floor. How many well, deals? Oh, so, sorry, just yeah. one thing. I would just say, if if I had to give one piece of advice to, because that angel thing always comes up. Yeah. I don't know if John's here or whatever, but this might be a this might be a long discussion later on. But look, I think ultimately what it comes down to is brand, right? So everybody always tells the founder focus on traction, and the one piece of advice I would give to investors is learn how to build a brand. Right, because on the one, on the one, it, it does three things for you. One is, is that it gets you with your brand makes certain kinds of founders want to come to you. You with a brand keeps other people from basically screwing you. And I think the third thing is that like um, it's an incredible, incredible um, value add for your portfolio long term. So the summary is less meetings and more tweeting for for investors. Love it. One word answer for the three of you: How many deals are you going to do in 2013? Uh, Tom Weithman? First time transactions, about 30. 30? Tom I'd Dan? Say, I'd say for us, it's probably more like 20. Okay. Well, we, we average about 150 new ones a year. So 200 deals among the three of you? Great. Well, good luck. Laura, you want to? Uh, we'll open it up for questions if anyone has comments or questions for the panel. I, I hope these are hard hitting questions, by the yes. way. Phil McCarthy? Transwestern. You guys spent a lot of time talking about recommendations for super experienced entrepreneurs. What about the guys that have a good idea or have an idea um, and, and in funny ways don't know where to turn? How would you advise them? How would you tell them to turn? What would you hope you say to those folks? Who is the question for? Well, I, I'll tell you where we run into this a lot, and uh, it's uh, it tech, it's uh, tech transfer stuff that's coming out of universities, Hopkins, wherever, uh, where you've got that guy who has that really great idea, but you know he he doesn't really know how to turn that into a business. And I think the key for that person is to find a partner, a business partner who can actually help him wrap that idea in, and and figure out like the go-to-market strategy for that idea that would be the one key piece of advice. I think just depending on the vertical you're in, if you're in internet, like the internet tech space, unfortunately with an idea you're just not going to get funded. There's just too much quality deal flow out there and it's, um, it's just, it is what it is. I think in terms of fleshing it out, I, you know, I, I'd expand what Tom said. I think almost everyone needs a partner. Everybody has relative strengths and relative deficits. And if you don't know where to turn, there are a number of resources that are out there in the community that are no more than one or two connections away from someone that's likely to be knowledgeable about what you're doing. Start with an SBDC. Start with the tech transfer office if that's where you are. Start with an entrepreneurial resource center at the university. Come to an organization like CIT or, or like DBED or... Uh, you know, the, the, the networking at an event like this is quite powerful. Uh, go to TN, who's the ultimate connector, uh, or, or find someone that knows someone like a TN, and, and, and find that other person at least to give informal advice and mentoring, if not outright partnership, in building the enterprise. Don't prepare too much, though. It seems to me, I don't know if you guys agree with me on this, but like, it seems to me that some of our best successes um, have been through naive founders that actually had no idea where the wall was. Uh, so it, it, maybe the summary of maybe the advice I would give is just like just start doing something. The, the the concern would be just don't don't talk too much to other people. Everybody's really good at giving advice. Nobody's really good at taking it. De yes. A default towards action, I think, is what you're talking about. Yeah. Right. Uh, Kendrick uh, first, and then you. Go um, ahead, Kendrick. One of the first companies I started working for when I was I think 17 was actually a CIT fund uh, company called uh, Kids Online. Um, I think they pivoted out or spun out to KZO, um, but we were in the garage um, of the CIT building. And that core group of people who started have now gone on and started their own companies, and they're all doing fairly well, and they've raised money. Um, which brings me to my point of uh, another company that was announced today uh, called Speak that just closed uh, $1.2 million. And what does that say about second-time entrepreneurs and how important they are to the community and raising money and how they would be able to raise money? Well, yeah, 
I, I mean, I think it, when you think about what's the key differentiator between you know the Silicon Valley and, and here, it's the just the density of serial entrepreneurs they've got out there is huge. And it plays into the angel investing and the number of people who are starting companies and everything. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, we, we try to do when we're funding a company is to, um, to try to do it in a way that it actually motivates and aligns and works for everyone and creates a successful entrepreneur. Because you really want that guy to succeed, sell his company, and go and do it again and again and again. And so, you know, I mentioned before, you know, one of the things we're doing is proactively going out and building relationships with people who have done this and then backing them so that they'll move forward. But, uh, you know, one of the things we all look for when we have a big success in the region, and it goes back to, you know, when AOL was a huge hit, everyone was predicting all these guys are going to spin out of AOL and do startup companies, right? And then Living Social and everyone was thinking, you know, you're going to see a, a proliferation of companies. You need some big hits like that is the other thing, in, you know, in the in the region that will, where people, you know, uh, exit those with having made a lot of money on their options and are kind of ready to go out and apply their knowledge to uh, building their own company. Uh, so those two things. Uh, just as a, as a personal bias, just a personal bias is that I'd rather fund somebody that failed the last time than to fund somebody that succeeded the last time. M my theory on this, I have no data to prove this actually, but just my theory on this is that like, the, uh, this actually happened to me with my own startup. So I, I sold my first startup, I, and then all of a sudden I, I have this, I feel like I, I can touch anything and it'll turn to gold, and I, I just failed to innovate the second time. And my fear of like investing, if somebody has just exited and then goes right into something else, my fear is that they may or may, or may not actually innovate. So my point, my point is I would love to invest in uh, somebody that just failed. I'd rather do that deal than invest in somebody that just succeeded. Yeah, just a twist on what you just said is uh, I don't consider it to be a bad thing if somebody has failed. What I really want to know is what were their takeaways from that failure? And uh, because you learn, actually, you learn a huge lot more from failures than you do from successes where you may have just been, you know, rising tide lifts all boats, member of a great team, and you just kind of rode, rode that. The failures uh, sharpen the edges on everything. So learn, you know, what did they? What was their takeaway? If their takeaway is that you know VCs suck, that's kind of a negative. <laughs> but uh, but if their takeaway is you know I wish I had done this this and this differently, and, I, and that's what I'm going to do with my next deal, then 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 that's a productive failure. All right. Yes, sir. I have two um, questions. So first question is that uh, what all of you like uh, the venture capitalists and those. What do you think the technology is going for two years from now? Like which which market is really coming in this is strong? I know the big data and some of the things is like a big name. That will be what is your prediction where the market will be technology like this? One question. The second question is because of the communication is now so easy from different parts of the world. So people have different virtual teams in different places, even founders are not scattered across the globe. How do you have suggestions for them when you have founders? They're working so I think for the Did first. Did you want to repeat the question, Paul? Real yeah, quick. I, I think there right. were two questions. One was, um, one was, uh, where do we see the markets going, or trends? And the second one was, uh, how do we think about distributed teams? Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to just skip the first one because I think we, as an industry, have been notoriously bad at predicting where the market's going to go. I'd rather just tell you what I invest in. Um, and, and so I'll, I just, I'll just skip that question. I think the second thing though is uh, um, I don't really care where the teams are as long as there's traction. I mean, as long as there's, so the I think at that stage, the best predictor of future performance is previous track record. So I don't really care where they're located, but if they're, if they're shipping, if they're delivering, let's do it. Tom and Tom, you, you need to have people in Virginia okay. and Maryland, right? right? Well, yeah. Respectively. Uh, well, no, I mean, I, actually, the, the question of, uh, of this whole distributed team idea is really an offshoot of what we were talking about before about uh, just how the virtualization of so many aspects of business allows you to have people that are geographically dispersed. And, you know, we, yeah, we run into companies that are looking for, for, uh, for us to fund them. And I guess the, the, the issue for us 
state of Maryland is, okay, if we give you money, where are you going to build out your headcount in the future? Because early on, you could have teams that are spread out all over the country and in India or wherever else. But when a company starts to, you know, really grow and add headcount and, and to develop into that next stage company, where are they going to be based and where are they going to be, be hiring people? And, and that's kind of what, what, you know, an interest that, that we have. But early on, really early, uh, you know, they, they may be just being as efficient as possible and not spending a lot of money as founders before they get funded. You know, in terms of the geog uh, geographic distribution, uh, you know, it's inevitable and it, it, it's a good thing. There are various skills in various areas of the world. I would say if you have a distributed team of founders, um, you know, we, we certainly look for evidence of cohesiveness in the team. And, you know, it takes me back to, you know, college relationship. It's hard to build a relationship long distance. There's got to be something there. There has to be time spent together. Um, but before you separate, before, before you are geographically distributed, it's going to make that work and make that relationship uh, tick and talk. That's a good point. I think we have time for one more. Um, two more. Okay, we'll do Bob and then Jeanette, and then uh, we can continue on afterwards. But go Paul, ahead. Paul, I'd heard you talking about the, I think, 85 data sources that you analyze. What are you looking for, and how does that affect your, your investing? Well, so um, that's a good question. Uh, so this would take a long time for me to explain it holistically. So let me just explain a, uh, an edge case or a, one example because that, that might make more sense. So if you think about my model, um, the model is let me put uh, a small check in first and then figure out where the second check goes, right? So the way that we look, the way that we actually uh, behave in the markets is it's a median 50K check on the first, first time around. Second time check is typically 100 to 250K if, if we're in. Third checks are 500 to a million. And I just tell my guys, like, as long as you're, you're performing, I got unlimited money for shit that works. Now, the placement of that second check is really, really, really important. And if you think of our size, up until about February this year, it was just me, Dave, and Christine. Um, so we're a small team. Now, just imagine for a minute, let's just say uh, I've invested in uh, you, you, your company. Um, if I'm watching you, let me just use the analogy and then I'll go to the data sources. If I'm watching you in this room and I see you on the other side of the room talking to an investor, that one interaction in itself doesn't really mean much. There's no context there. But if like 15 minutes later I see you over here with another investor, now it's starting to get a little bit inter more interesting. And then, you know, th the point is, is that you might be through your actions indicating that you're about to raise another round. Now, where it gets interesting is that a lot of us are on Facebook, on Twitter, on Quora, on AngelList, uh, on all these different platforms that we all know about. Uh, what gets very interesting is I can just watch you remotely. I don't have to be in the same room here. What I can do is start to see, uh, man, did Tom just follow you on AngelList? Well, again, that one action doesn't mean anything, but if I know that Tom's team has all of a sudden, within a very short period of time, started following you or interacting with you or the frequency of the photos that you're tagged in are increasing, and because you're a smart founder, you're talking to five other investors, they're doing the same thing, what it, that causes what I would describe as convergence. doesn't mean that I should invest. It just means that in my system, it needs to flag me real quick and say, he's up to something. Let's call him and see what's up, figure out whether we want to put more money in. Uh, where this gets really, really interesting is that um, uh, we've, we're starting to see enough deal flow now where we can actually predict what the, uh, or we're starting to be able to predict what those secondary term sheets will look like. And we may even be able to do a bridge right in the middle and, and bump our own IRR. Um, I really do think, by the way, that like what we're doing here is uh, what happened, in, we're just copying what happened in the public markets five years ago. And I'll just make an assertion actually, by the way, just to go one more step further. Um, I think actually in three to five years, it's not gonna be crazy to think of high frequency trading on the private markets. And if you don't believe, and that's what crowdfunding is gonna do. Crowdfunding is not going to increase the number of small businesses that get first round funding. They're gonna increase liquidity for us at the B round. And if you don't believe me, what you do is you look on AngelList right now, you can pick random companies on AngelList and you can invest in thousand dollar increments without ever meeting the founder. So couldn't it be a surmise that with a, with a bunch of data like mine and little buttons like that, I could just build scripts to algorithmically buy and sell? So we're seeing, it really is, it's, it's just what's happening. What's happening in the private markets happened in the public markets five years ago. Very interesting. Jeanette, uh, go for it. Question for Paul or John. Any deal that you passed up uh, that you wish you hadn't? And if so, why did you pass up and did you learn from that? 
Well, I'm going to make myself look good and say that that has never happened. But <laughs> I, I know, I know, um, I, you know, I've actually never really paid much attention to that. I know that one deal that uh, Dave and I joke about a lot is Uber. Um, when we had looked at Uber, uh, I think, I think the, the founder had called us like three times, and three times we were like, two or three times we were like, nah, not seeing it, not seeing it. And then the next week, we see it on TechCrunch that they've just raised money. But the big difference between that first, that, that last call and the fundraising was Travis became the CEO. And we knew Travis much better. And um, that was, uh, yeah, th th I don't know. I mean, I, I think the way I think about this is just personally, just from a thesis standpoint, I don't really look at the passes that often. Um, as long as I know that I made the best decision I could with all the data. The only time I would ever regret a deal uh, pass or uh, whether it was a pass or an investment is if I missed a data source that was um, really crucial to that decision. And uh, luckily, I don't think I've run into that just yet. Uh, every pass that we've made uh, at this point feels like it was um, the best decision we could have made within that, um, within the data, the data that was available at that time. You know, our, our, our probably our, our greatest successes and our greatest misses have been around uh, around bets on people. Uh, and, and I, yeah, I can think of a deal or two where we, we perhaps we uh, didn't fully understand what the entrepreneur had to bring uh, to the table that we that we took a pass on that we might not do again. Uh, so uh, you know, I think we our team learned something from that, and hopefully we wouldn't make the same mistake twice. Um, conversely, uh, the, the biggest mistakes we've had uh, uh, in our portfolio, things we've invested in, have invariably been around the people, not the technology or the markets. Uh, yeah, I, uh, so my, my perspective on this has actually uh, changed since, because uh, I, I was out in private venture and then, uh, and then with the state of Maryland now, and it, it is a different perspective. Uh, I fall into Paul's category of just, uh, you know, you make the best decision you can when you can, and then you move on, and that's historically I just haven't really, really uh, worried too much over deals that I passed on. Uh, the, uh, you know, now that I'm wearing my state of Maryland hat, I, I guess I could say that uh, it would be a really great thing if a company that we passed on was a huge success without having us have to put any resources into it and we could put those into some other company in Maryland. So, yeah. I, actually, that just reminded me, I'm pretty sure before 500, this is probably three or four years ago at least, um, before 500, Dave was given the opportunity to invest in Aaron Battalion at Living Social and didn't. I just want to point out, I was not involved in that pass, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I want to thank the panel. Tom Weithman, Tom Dan, and Paul Singh, and thank everybody here for coming, and uh, uh, enjoy the holiday season. Thank you.